Welcome in to another edition of the All Things Bama podcast powered by BamaCentral.com, your Sports Illustrated home for all things Alabama, whether it's football, basketball, baseball season, now full swing, softball as well. Uh, we have you all covered for any Crimson Tide sport. I'm your host, Tyler Martin. Join with me, Bama Central staff writers, Joey Blackwell and Tony Sue Collis, here to talk Crimson Tide hoops, a big pickup on the Alabama football recruiting trail, and Alabama's trip to Austin, Texas this weekend to face the number one ranked Longhorns. Guys, should be exciting. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite times of the year when you have every sport outside of football really going on at Alabama, right? You've got both diamond sports. You've got both basketball teams going on. And this weekend's pretty packed in Tuscaloosa, starting with Alabama against South Carolina. Uh, but, yeah, just a great time all around, and especially great when Alabama picks up a midweek victory like they did on Tuesday night against Vanderbilt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great time to be, if you're an Alabama sports fan, to be involved. But like you said, it's, it's spring football's coming up soon, so even they'll be in action. There's pretty much everything going on campus. Even uh, golf will be starting up. Actually, golf started up this past weekend as well. So pretty much everything's going on on campus right now. It's definitely a busy time as a fan, as a sports writer. It's just a, a lot of work, but it's uh, great to have so much you know content to be covering right now for sure. As someone that covers exclusively football for this website, um, I, I prefer the fall in terms of coverage. But uh, no, I, I do enjoy some of the, I, I guess, to, to take a look at some of the other sports outside of football uh, and, and help out, uh, you know, in that aspect as well. And then obviously recruiting never sleeps. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, no, recruiting, I'm glad you mentioned it. We'll start there, Tony. Uh, recruiting is a monster in and of itself, and Alabama picks up its second commitment in the 2023 class. It already had Elliott Washington Jr., whose father played basketball at the Capstone. Uh, they picked him up about a month or so ago, um, and, and, you know, he's a defensive back out of uh, Venice, Florida. And guess what? Alabama picks up another defensive back, Jalil Hurley out of Florence, a five-star prospect. Um, you did some digging on him. What did you find out about Jalil Hurley? What does he bring to the table, Tony, uh, for the Alabama Crimson Tide next year? I think the number one thing that you, when you look at Jalil Hurley is just his versatility. Um, you know, he's 6'2", maybe a little bit taller than 6'2", uh, and about 170 pounds. He's got the length and the speed if you want to match him up against any kind of receiver on the outside. But I think he's a guy, if you put some weight on him, he could be a safety. You could play him in the box. And when I talked with Jaleel, I asked him, you know, where do you want to play it out of them? And he just mentioned being a, you know, a versatile defensive back. And he, he kind of just wants to work with whatever's going to help him get on the field soonest. And, you know, like, I don't think he really has a preference. I think he's, he's pretty flexible. And I think that's exactly what Alabama is going to want to hear. Um, you know, his, his former his defensive back coach at Florence high school compared him to Minka Fitzpatrick, kind of that ability to play everywhere. Um, he's also a really hardworking kid. He kind of shares a lot of those traits that Minka had. I think to compare him like for like for Minka Fitzpatrick, it's a little too early for that. Sure. But um, when you're talking about the versatility and the talent that he brings, um, it, it's truly elite. Uh, and I think he, this is the start of a really big defensive backs class for Alabama because there's still, you know, Tony Mitchell and AJ Harris in state. Um, th there's plenty of defensive backs out there that Alabama is in the mix for. Um, so this is just the start. I mean, these two guys, and, and what a start it is too, because, you know, Elliot Washington, we call him Elliot Washington Jr. or Elliot Washington the second. I don't know, but he's he's good and comparing and mixing him with uh, Jalil Hurley that you're setting yourself up nicely for the future. No doubt about it. And, and to just yeah, with Jalil Hurley, when I saw that that post or the story you wrote, Tony, it was on Twitter. I saw the little uh, the tag you're talking. You, you used the Minka Fitzpatrick quote from his defensive back coach, and I'm like, hold up now, because Minka Fitzpatrick, you know, I, I would consider him one of Saban's all time favorite players that he's ever coached, right? Because he was a student of the game. I mean, you know, uh, you know, he, he, he was all about learning and getting better and perfecting his craft, even as a freshman from when he first stepped foot on campus at Alabama. Like, that's high praise, right? Um, that's high praise. And I think Jaleel Hurley is, 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 could potentially be, you know, that, that big name of this class, right? I mean, he was obviously one of the top three players in the state of Alabama in a loaded class. And Alabama went out and got him. And this is kind of really setting the, t the stage or table, whatever you want to call it, um, for Alabama to really just um, start popping off commitments here, right? Uh, you mentioned Tony Mitchell, um, but I think of other in-state kids on the defensive line like Peter Woods, Kelby Collins. I think we're about to start seeing the trickling of commitments come in. And this typically happens, right, because you're about to have guys back on campus. You know, spring football's coming up. Guys will be able to go to practices. Um, so you're going to see that kind of trickling in as we get closer into the summer. 
and really there too because the calendar, you know, has just changed everything. It's made guys kind of commit earlier in the cycle in terms of the year rather than later. But good stuff on Jaleel Hurley there, Tony. Let's switch the let's switch the over now to the hardwood. Alabama, I mentioned it in the opening. Alabama 74, Vanderbilt 72. Three straight wins now, guys. Immemorial um, gymnasium for Alabama, something I, I never thought I would see really uh, in, in recent years. Um, just a really tough place to play. They almost blew it there, right? I mean, if, if the officiating got a little ticky-tack there with Scotty Pippen Jr., who literally shot 13 free throws over the final three minutes and 40 seconds. That was a little crazy. Um, but just what was y'all's main takeaway this week from beating Vanderbilt and then going into uh, a game against South Carolina where on paper Alabama should win, but right now Alabama and South Carolina are tied for fifth place in the SEC? I really like the defensive effort shown from Alabama in this game. Um, obviously, the offensive effort, the offensive scoring still wasn't there. But as Oates has said pretty much all season, is that once you're locked in on defense, the shots are eventually going to fall. I think it was a dramatic improvement on the defensive end of the court compared to how it was um, against Kentucky. Um, it's like it's, this, this, it's been the same story with Alabama all year. It seems like whenever uh, one side of the basketball works, the other side doesn't. And we saw the polar opposite that we did against Kentucky. Um, but uh, some bright spots, you know, J.D. Davidson continued to be solid. You know, he had a double-double with 10 rebounds and 10 points. Javon Quinley coming off the bench had 19 points. Um, Keon Ellis was limited to 10, but, you know, that kind of goes back to what we've said before. It seems like with Alabama and their guard play, it's almost like it's a curse. that like You can't have more than one playing well at the same time, and that just continued to be a problem. You know, Jaden Shackelford was kind of uh, kind of had the same impact on the scoreboard as Ellis did, but JQ is fortunately able to shine through and kind of get them the points they needed to win. But obviously there's still some things to improve on, but fortunately these next two games, you know, South Carolina and Texas A&M, Alabama can probably lock up a five seed in the SEC tournament. Um, they also, the, the, really the only really difficult game will, will be LSU on the road to close up the season. Um, it's still a winnable game, but it'll definitely be a challenge. Um, but, you know, this, Alabama has been so unpredictable all season. You never really know when they're going to show up and when they're not. And these games could definitely be potential stumbling blocks um, over the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing I take from it, is Javon Quinterly just going to be the sixth man? Is, is that like where he shines the, the brightest? I'm serious. Some players play better off the bench and that might not necessarily be like what he wants. You know, I don't think it's the sexiest option, but like, I feel like he plays better off the bench. Maybe he needs that motivation. Maybe he sees the game um, a little bit and is able to get into it. But he, we saw him last year excel in that role, and you put him in this year and he's doing it. I would keep him off the bench in, until he proves otherwise. Well, I mean, you know, even last year in the SEC tournament, I mean, he won SEC tournament MVP by coming off the bench. Right. The, the dude just thrives um, in that scenario. Obviously, if you're wanting, if he's wanting to go to the NBA, he needs to learn to play when he's not coming off the bench. But right now, you know, over his career at Alabama, that's really just been the case. I mean, even in the NBA, I mean, there's certain players that would, Manu Ginobili was was like that. He was just a guy off the bench. And, and you're like, no offense to Javon Quinterly, but if he does make the NBA, he's, he's, it's not going to be a starter. Uh, so I, it's, it's not the worst thing for him. I, I think, you know, if, if Javon Quinterly wants to make the NBA – at, at the size that he is, he's going to have to play defense. And I think, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's the number one thing. You mentioned that. And that's what, you know, if I'm Nate Oates, um, that's what I'd be selling him along with, you know, hey, you're not going to play if you don't play defense. But also, like, a guy like Javon Quinterly, you need to play defense. He, he's not going to make the NBA if he doesn't play defense. Same for him. Well, same, I, same for well, Jake Shackelford. Well, I think that's why we saw him come off the bench. You know, Nate Oates last week was talking about, not this past, not last week, but on Monday was talking about, you know, how important it was for his players to play defense. And if they weren't going to play defense, well, they weren't going to play. And, you know, Quinterly has been a regular starter for Alabama this year, obviously. Um, but, you know, he, he Quinterly even talked after the game about how he's comfortable coming off the bench. But the reason that was was because of lack of defensive effort. So hopefully a message has been sent to him, and we'll see him start moving forward with that same defensive intensity. But, you know, if he has to come off the bench, then then so be it. It's it's whatever is going to improve his game overall. Well, let's not forget, yeah, J.D. Davison's double-double. I mean, it's the second double-double yeah. of his career. You know, maybe him, maybe it's the reverse, too. You know, maybe, maybe someone is more comfortable starting the game. Maybe that gave J.D. the confidence that he needed. I don't know. But, like, it, it seemed like a winning formula. The shots are going to fall for Alabama. So if they play the defense like they did with the intensity against – uh, Vanderbilt I think it's going to be a winning formula it's just about keeping that which they haven't been able to do 
Yeah, and, and and JQ heard that message loud and clear. I mean, when, when Oates was talking in that press conference at the beginning of the week, it was it was directed at him for the most part, right? Um, and he came out there in that second half, guys. And I mean, what, he had seventeen, he had nineteen altogether, seventeen in the second half, four. I mean, four assists. I mean, he just uh, that was. I mean, that JQ when he gives that effort and he's gotten that you know hit three threes as well. So when he's shooting the ball like that, there is not many better guards in the country. And, I'm, hey, Auburn's got a great backcourt. Uh, you know, Kansas has got a great backcourt. Baylor's got a great backcourt. But there's not many guys who I would pick in the country over Javon Quinterly when he is playing like that. He showed it last year. And guess what? You know, after the game, uh, he, he posted a highlight of that, that behind-the-back pass to Rojas, which, is, which was pretty dope. I mean, that was a pretty sick pass. And he was like, you know, he's like, March is coming up. And this is what I wanted to kind of get into, right, is that we're on the cusp now of tournament time. And I think what we saw Tuesday night, it was a tough character win. And I'm glad Nate's called it a character win because that's what it is. But the light, I think, is coming on in these guys' head. And the switch is saying, all right, you know, for us to make a run, we got to do it now, right? We got to be playing our best basketball right now. And the schedule lines up for them to be able to make that run and be able to do that. And, I, you know, you're going to have to win ugly in March, right? And, and no matter, and Alabama did that last year against Iona in the first round. Their first game, if they're a five seed and we'll get into bracketology, whatever they are, that first game, they're probably going to have to win that really ugly because the 12 seeds right now, for example, in Joe Lenardi's bracket, guess what? It's Davidson, it's Iona. It, two out of the four, that's two teams you lost to already, right? And North Texas is another who's really good and playing some of the best basketball in the country right now. Um, but yeah, JQ playing like that, he goes as this team goes. I've been trying to tell a lot of people this, and they get upset about the turnovers, but he's got a positive turnover to assist ratio. JD Davison is a guy who I'd be more worried about the turnovers. I mean, he had five against Vanderbilt. Um, it, it, that's more that that's where Alabama really needs to thrive. And, and that's not turning the ball over. And that's where I think, Joey, where you're talking about these guards getting it all together all in the same game. Well, it's the turnover issues, right? And I think some of it is a little bit of just youth with JD, right? I mean, the game's a lot quicker than it is right at Calhoun, where he was last year in high school, or even AAU, right? The game's a lot quicker at the college level. Um, and he's figuring that out. He's been playing his best ball over the last two weeks. And I like what I'm seeing from this team. They needed a win like they got. Because think about it. Vandy had the size advantage on them. Betty Yako got in foul trouble early in that game uh and you know they were able to to in Rojas Rojas played his tail off as well so I think some key pieces for Alabama are really starting to figure it out um but let's go ahead and get into some, some bracket talk right here um and, and we still got three regular season games one guaranteed SC tournament game so there's a little bit left but at the end of the day guys this Alabama team they're they're they I guess their ceiling is a four seed in my opinion and they could I mean if they lost all th all four in the next four games they could go to eight or nine I guess um, maybe a seven, honestly, is their floor, in my opinion. I don't think they can fall much farther than the seven. Um, but to me, I, Alabama's in a good position right now because, listen, that 12 seed, say they're a five seed, that 12 seed is probably going to be like, man, we want to play Alabama, right? Because we see the losses to Missouri. We see the losses to Georgia. But if Alabama somehow gets out of that and then they're in the Sweet 16 and they got to face a one seed like Gonzaga, Gonzaga probably doesn't want to play them again. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it matters between – four and seven I think we were talking about this off off camera it's more about how Alabama's playing than it does about wh where they're seated because this team's so unpredictable I mean would it really surprise you like what what are the 12 seeds on, on the projected brackets would it really surprise you if Alabama got bounced by one of those teams I mean you, you look at what they did against Iona against Davidson like those are probably like the equivalent right to like your 12 seeds I, I mean in this team yeah, like, like Davidson yeah yeah you know what I'm saying? So, both, I, but, well, both Lunardi and SI currently have North Texas as the 12th seed. Um, if you want to go over to um, Jerry Palm, he has Alamo as a four seed, but he has them playing the 13th seed Towson in the first round in that one. I mean, I'm they're probably going to win their, their first game, but like, I don't necessarily think it's that different between play. Alabama is one of these teams that if you talk about, like, let's say they did, the, you said worst case go to eight, right? If Alabama was to go to eight, they're one of the teams that you could see still making it out of the sweet 16 at that eight seed. The eight seed's usually a death penalty because you have to play the number one seed uh, in the next round, but Alabama has proven it can beat number one seeds, you know? So I, it's kind of a weird situation. It, I would almost take, I would, you know, from an Alabama perspective, I'd rather have eight seed Alabama playing at its best than five seed Alabama, not playing at its best. You know? So I think these next few games, like, if Nate Oates really wants to make a statement about the defense, hold to that. Because I don't necessarily, not to say like these games don't matter, every games matter, but like 
Alabama is not on the bubble. It's not really playing for its life. And if he, if NATO needs to experiment to get a point across, I think that was the time to do it. Yeah. Um, because I don't think the seeding, you know, between, and it's not going to be an eight seed, but you know, between being a six or a four, that's not going to matter for Alabama if they can't figure out consistency. 100%. Well, yeah. And on top of that also, you know, wins at this point, like you said, they don't really matter right now. It's, it's, you're going to make the tournament, uh, according to team rankings, which I was looking at yesterday, Alabama has currently has a 100% chance of making the NCAA tournament. So they could literally lose the next four games, be bounced the first round of the SC tournament and still make it. The, but, the, but the thing is about the NCAA tournament, it doesn't matter whether you win by one point in a free throw with half a second left or if you win by 30 points. It yeah. doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're winning. So right now, like you said, Tony, I'm just reiterating your point. Right now is the time that they need to be coming around and, and NATO needs to be experimenting because once after these three games are over, it's done. Uh, whatever mistakes you have, they're just going to be there pretty much. You can, the, the tournament is not a time where you're trying to change up your lineup and trying to figure things out. You're going to automatically go with what you think is going to work best or at least over the course of the regular season. And, and another thing is, guys, and I, this is a side note, Alabama, if they do get a top five seed, right, I, I mean, it is the second I – mean, it's, the, it's the first time in 15 seasons that they will have had made the, they will made the NCAA tournament in back-to-back years, right, for the first time in 15 years. That is that's crazy, and I would have to do even more. I mean, it had probably be closer to twenty the last time Alabama got two top five seeds back to back seasons. So this program is headed in a, a, a wonderful direction. Uh, it's 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 really only up, and it continues to go up. And so I, I know everybody wants to sit there and, and you know, on Twitter and social media and want to call out qualms, you know, and, and go kind of crazy at the end of the Vanderbilt game. But here's the reality, right? Nate Oates is still a super young coach. He was literally coaching. He was literally coaching high school. He was a high school math teacher seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, right? And he's still learning as a coach. He's still tinkering. He's still figuring out how to get the best out of his players late in the year, right? And I think you're going to see that moving forward, Tony, um, with, you know, the South Carolina game and Texas A&M, these last two home games, especially, you know, him kind of tinker with this before they go on the road to LSU because LSU is going to be a tough test, no doubt about that. Um, it always is down there in Baton Rouge. But I think you're going to see J.D. in that starting lineup. And you're going to see J.Q. coming off the bench because it works. And as the games come, as the games continue to come along, the pressure mounts with every single game, right? And that's where it kind of goes to my point of saying, well, we can look at the Missouri game. We can look at the Georgia-Iona game, right? Those are in January, November, December. Um, and, and the fact is, right, there's not – those aren't many high-pressure games. And, I, and I'm not saying they don't have to play, you know, up, up to that standard every time, but it's basketball, right? There's going to be ebbs and flows, good day, bad days. But with Alabama and this moxie of this team, they're going to re- – I think there's the last year's experience, the four or five players who are from that team are going to say, look at the younger guys and say, hey, you know, because Charles Bediaco's coming along, right? The guys got to remember, he's still got his body to fill out. I mean, he's still a freshman. He's just now starting to figure it out. Same with J.D., they're going to look at that experience from last year and they're going to say, hey, we know how to win in March. We did it last year. We won two games in March. And I think that's going to kind of carry them and carry the leaders of this team like Javon Quinterly, like Jaden Shackelford, like a James Rojas. That's going to carry them now because when the lights are brightest, I think this Alabama team plays really, really well. And we've seen that in their in their quad one games this year. One, one thing I'm interested in is, you know, you look at Alabama's four guards and it, I don't think anyone expects any of them to be back, right? I think that's the, the, the general belief is that they'll all move on after this season but when you look from an nba draft perspective like who who there really has a guaranteed good spot in the nba draft J, jd will go first Jaden, Jaden shackleford well, yeah. jd and Jayden 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 Jayden. does Jaden shackleford really have a, a a good draft spot right now i don't think he does and and, and you know quinterly doesn't uh ellis doesn't anymore uh jd probably does just because of his athleticism but other than that, I mean, these guys are, are playing for their NBA draft status. You know, I think all these guys think that they're NBA players. I'm not sure if they all are, but they think that they're ready. And this is, it's time to put up or shut up. You know what I'm saying? If you don't show uh, over this next month, you know, that, that you're capable of doing that, you know, I, I don't think they're there yet. I don't think you can look at the resume. And even if, you know, J.D. Davison can play his way out of that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I think he's probably got just his athleticism alone and his his ceiling is so high that I think he probably has a spot. But the other three, I mean, they're going to have to really, you know, follow after Joshua Primo and, and kind of get hot at the right time. And, and I'm interested to see how they do that because uh, it's going to 
create a really interesting situation, you know, in, in a couple months if if they don't do that. Because I, I I think that they're unless they step up their games, uh, you know, a few of those guys are in for rude awakenings. That's a good point, Tony. And you know, with JD, JD's a surefire first rounder. Jaden Shackelford, he needs to come back. And, and I, I heard this. Um, you know, I, I know they're concrete on his his um on his future or not, but I, I heard this on, on one of the Twitter spaces that a lot of Alabama fans do, and I think someone made a great point is that he can be an Alabama legend, right? If he stays one more year, finishes up, you know, gets his degree, he can be recognized as that and really have a chance to be Alabama's leading scorer of all time. That's got to mean something to him. And I think I think it does because I think Jaden Chuckford obviously has, has had a great experience with the university. Um, and, you know, he, I know he tested the transfer portal last year, um, but, you know, that was, you know, his family made that decision and they were really just wanting to see what else was out there. And they realized, okay, Alabama is the best place for us. And, and you're seeing, you know, Jaden really take over as the leading scorer on this basketball team, especially on the road. You look, look at his splits. I mean, he's a different animal on, on the road um, than at home. But, yeah, no, I think Jaden Chalkford's 50-50 either way. Uh, JQ, Nate Oates confirmed that on, on his radio show or the Nate Oates show um, that JQ's done. I mean, JQ's like 23 years old. I don't think a lot of people realize that. I mean, I'm 25. JQ's 23, and I think he's ready to start his professional life, whether that's in the G League or whether that's, uh, you know, across the pond somewhere else over in Europe. Um, and then you have uh, JD gone, and then Keon Ellis is gone as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's it, there's going to be a lot of turnover, but you know who is staying? Noah Gurley is going to take advantage of that of that that COVID year. And I honestly think – we don't have to get into this now, but Noah Gurley's going to be a really big piece of the puzzle um, when Alabama starts the, you know, filling their 2022-2023 roster. Yeah, and so – you mentioned the possibility of like, before we get to girl, you mentioned the possibility of Jaden Shackelford coming back. And and I guess that's, that's, you know, that's valid, right? Look at who Alabama is bringing in, you know what I'm saying? And then look at who they're getting back into Mari Burnett. Like Jaden Shackelford might not even be the guy next year. So this is such a, a big point for him. Yeah. Even if he was going to come back, like, is he going to have the role on the team you know, the showcase that he has over these, over this next month, probably not next year. I think it's going to be more of a spread out role. I mean, you know, look at the the talent they're bringing in, like this next year's team is going to be loaded and it's going to have guards, you know, like a lot of good guards. So um, I think it's such a crucial point for, for Jaden Shackelford and, and then Noah Gurley though, to that point, um, this probably means, you know, I hate to talk about people before they leave, but you know, this probably means the end of, uh, Keon Ambrose Hilton at Alabama you you probably think that right yeah. um I, I I would you know if you're just looking at you know uh, you know I mean the, he doesn't get in the game know. now so yeah so uh, you know you, you look at him and, and then obviously Alex Chiku but uh, I think with with uh, Noah Gurley um, you're getting an experience big and you can't have enough of those so I, I mean that, that's a, that's a positive and Nate Oates is obviously really excited about it as well so positive for Alabama but um as far as Shackleford's concerned, I almost think it's better for both parties if he just has a good year and, and moves on. And that's not saying that Alabama wouldn't welcome him back. It's just like, I think that like, it's just, it's better for him if he's able to capitalize right now. Well, there was already that dense disinterest by his family and, and they last year and they encouraged him to potentially move on to better himself. And then they decided to stay for next year to get that in, get him NBA ready. And then that doesn't happen. It, I feel like Jaden Shackelford, I, if I was him, you know, I would pursue the transfer options again if I wasn't heading to the NBA. It doesn't make sense for him to stick around at Alabama if he hasn't really improved himself. And that's obviously I would like for him to stay because I really enjoy covering him. But at the same time, if I'm Jaden Shackelford, I'm sitting back and thinking, how did this year actually benefit me and, you know, in getting to the NBA aside from having some headlines here or there? But with Noah Gurley, you know, I, I think him coming back, one of the things that he's really had to work on this year was adjusting from, you know, obviously he played for Furman his first few, his first four years. And now he's here for, as a, came in as a grad transfer. This year was kind of an adjustment year for him, adjusting to the level of competition in the SEC. And I think he'll greatly benefit that, from that coming in the next year. You know, he'll, he'll have played a very tough schedule. He'll, you know, have played in the NCAA tournament for Alabama and won't know what that level of competition is like. He's already played teams like Gonzaga and Houston. So I think, you know, he was already experienced coming in, kind of like Jordan Bruner. He was kind of like a Jordan Bruner guy coming into this year. And I think that, you know, basically picture Jordan Bruner saying for next year year and taking all that he learned. That's basically what Alabama is getting out of Gurley. And I think it could be very beneficial to them. 
Yeah, and like I said, I, I think he is going to play a really, really big role in the team's success next year. He already is right now, right? I mean, we can go yeah. look at certain games like the Tennessee game earlier this year that he's really one of the main reasons why Alabama won that game. Um, but just that, man, that that going from, going from the SOCON to the SEC is just a massive leap. And uh, I'm really excited that he's staying. I, I think that's that's a that's a win right there because you're gonna be able to pair him again with Charles Bediaco coming back. He's gonna get bit, uh, bigger, you know. He's gonna more build out that frame. Um, and I again, I, I think if there's gonna be a Walker Kessler type breakout player for next year, it's Charles Bediaco. One last thing on uh, on um, on Jaden Shack for Tony. You mentioned the guards coming in, right? So Alvin has got two coming in. Jaden Bradley, number one point guard. He's pro- he's gonna be the team's primary ball handler. Then Rylan Griffin. Right, I think Jaden Bradley right now is obviously that plug and play guy. But is this? I mean, the, the question Jaden Shackford have to ask himself is: Is the guys coming in? Do are they ready right now? And I don't know if Rylan Griffin's a guy who's ready from day one, right? To, to go and start. He's a great scorer. I know. I know how good of a scorer he is, and how elite he is, and how off the ball he can he can get his own shot. But I don't know if he's a guy who would immediately come in and start playing over Jaden Shackford because Jaden Shackford could go ahead and start playing the same role he's playing this year next year right as that guy who can come in play off the ball too, not be the primarily ball handler which I think his family and him really wanted that they really wanted to be the primary ball handler to showcase his talent and showcase that aspect of his game and I think you know he could probably do that bit more next year than actually this year per se because you don't have JQ anymore coming off the bench and doing that I, yeah but I, I just think that he's like I going to Joey's point I, I think from Jaden Shackelford's perspective like he's going to want to find a situation where he'll be the guy and maybe in a different system if he doesn't think this one works i just don't think he's gonna and then from alabama's perspective if jake and Shackelford comes back who's leaving like because look at the you know it's already if, if, with you early know, coming back who's leaving <laughs> well, it's it's probably, like, that's the thing it's probably probably keon ambrose hilton that's yeah. you know um but like are, are you gonna send darius miles away and then you know do you have that more wing player uh like I, I, it's kind of interesting, you know, if, if you go down that, you know, who would stay? I mean, you're not going to, you know, get rid of Rylan Griffin before he even plays, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I think that like, it, it probably makes sense for both people, but I, I'm with Joey. I, I don't see Jaden Shackle for coming back. Even, I think he would transfer even, even if he did not make it in the, uh, you know, I, there's one thing to say that he's an Alabama legend and I'm sure that would mean a little bit to him, but at the same point, he's a California kid and, and all these kids are, they're, they're, you know, their ultimate goal is to make the NBA. And that's being an know, Alabama legend doesn't add cash to your wallet. <laughs> it really does. And I, I just, you know, I think he enjoys his time at Alabama and, you know, Alabama has enjoyed him, but this is probably it for him at Alabama. Um, and it's, like I said, the best thing for both parties is if JD, uh, if Jaden, uh, has a great season and is able to propel him into the uh, NBA because I think you know from an Alabama standpoint that's another guard you can say that you sent to the league and from obviously from Jaden Shackelford's standpoint it's you know a dream fulfilled and and, and a really big payday so um, that that's how I see it and I, I just don't I don't see him coming back and I, I, basketball rosters are so fluid anyways yeah. um, I think Alabama is prepared for him not to come back. Yeah, I, I think they have to, right, because he's, he's going to look at all of his options. Um, but I will say this, Joey, I, you know, being a part of the Alabama network, that alumni base, um, when basketball's done, it can really help you out in the long run. Just go talk to guys like Rodney Cooper or uh, Trevor Relaford for sure. Oh, no, it uh, definitely can. I was just meaning it's not going to pay him a steady paycheck. That's what I meant by oh, that. Where Jane Shackford would. Go. Jane Shackford can go play in Europe uh, after this year, right, and make a great yeah. living. I mean, seriously, I don't know about his NBA prospects. I don't think they're that high, but he can go play professionally elsewhere as well. But um, that's that's a lot of offseason chatter, which we'll get into, I'm sure, over the next couple of months. Alabama takes on South Carolina. Frank Martin's team just beat Mississippi State. A uh, huge win for them. Uh, you know, they're, they're sitting 92nd in Ken Palm, so a little low. Uh, this is going to be one of Alabama's, uh, you know, quad three games. But, uh, you know, Frank Martin's teams are always physical. They're always tough. They, they embody their coach. And, you know, Alabama's, you know, in the past, you know, when, when they've come to Coleman or when Alabama's gone to Columbia, you know, it's grinded out type games. And, uh, and Alabama's been on, you know, hasn't been on the benef- – hasn't been the beneficiary of some of them in the recent history. Um, but, uh, you know, guys, what do you think about this matchup right here with South Carolina coming into it and, and Alabama's prospects of winning this one and getting, you know, a game above them, you know, as they fight for the fifth seed in the SEC tournament? 
this is such a trap game for Alabama because like now they're going to hear yep. like, Oh, we're in the easy part of our schedule. This is like, you know, we can almost kick back or like, you know, like and now we're expected to win. This is exactly where Alabama starts to fall apart. Um, they have six straight wins over South Carolina. And that's just like, I don't know, for me, that's kind of like bad mojo for Alabama. You know, like it, it, I'm a big believer in like everything balancing out. And uh, you know, so like, I think you, you said it, you have a tough Frank Martin team that's, hitting Alabama in a spot where maybe it thinks that it's about to go on this run and it hasn't necessarily gone on the run yet. And then you've got a South Carolina team that I don't know if you believe in karma might be due against Alabama. I just, you know, that's probably not the the smartest basketball analysis right there, but I do feel like this could be a big trap game for Alabama. Yeah. And they have a uh, two really solid guards and Jermaine Cousinard and Eric Stevenson, both are averaging over 11 points a game. Uh, I, I really think that they could provide Alabama some some struggles considering how their guards been playing on defensively over the past couple of games here. Now, they did do well against Vanderbilt, Alabama did, but at the same time before that defense was just lackluster. So if Alabama isn't able to carry over that defensive effort from Vanderbilt, you know, players like those two could really give them issues, especially on the perimeter. So um, I'm interested to see how they stack up. Fortunately, it'll be Alabama's, you know, triumphant return back to Coleman Coliseum. It seems like forever since they've been there. Um, so I, they always play well um, on their home court. So hopefully that'll benefit them. But, you know, it, it's at the same time, South Carolina is not a team to be underestimated at all. Six straight against South Carolina. I, I did not realize that, Tony. I, I know Alabama had one. You know, they won last year, obviously. That one was in – or two years ago, that one was in Coleman. They won last year. It was in Columbia because um, this is one of that series that just flip-flops. But, man, I didn't realize it was six straight because uh, I, I remember going back to the Avery Johnson, Anthony Grant. I mean, South Carolina was a tough team no matter uh, no matter who was at the helm, uh, uh, even before Frank Martin got there when Alabama had to go play them. Like I said, they're 92nd in Ken Palm. Uh, they're 28th in adjusted defensive efficiency, so they're tough on that end. But guess what? They're 178th in adjusted offensive efficiency. So, Al, you know, NATO's been preaching this defense, seen improve. Well, you know, it should improve against the 178th best offense in the in America. It, it should, but <laughs> you, you know, we, we we've seen we've seen Alabama do a lot of things that it shouldn't do this season. So. Uh, <laughs> It really is just a, I think this is a good prove it game. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, all, all the things, I mean, this really shouldn't be a game that Alabama loses, but at the same time, um, th they need to prove that they're an elite team. You know, it's not just on occasion, elite teams win these kind of games and then they, they win them convincingly. And I'm not saying that it doesn't really matter if Alabama wins this game convincingly, but they need to start proving that they are, you know, a ranked team, that they're an elite team, a, a team that's going to, you know, not only beat big ones, but also take advantage uh, of the games that they're supposed to win. And Carolina would need to go on a run to make the NCAA tournament. And this would be a huge win for them if, if they if they do want to get back to the NCAA tournament. Because Frank Martin, you know, he's a guy, you look at the SEC coaches, he's a guy who could be fired after this year, right? I mean, he's got that one final four or he could retire. I mean, he's health-wise, he doesn't look like he's in the greatest shape right now and he doesn't that's how it's been all season I know COVID took a toll on him last year too um and he, he's talked about that in his press conferences the way the game is changing and all these all these different changes he doesn't know how long how much longer he wants to be a part of it but again this is you go out and you go beat a, a top 25 Ken Palm team in Alabama um that's a that's a signature signature quad one victory um for the Gamecocks if they're able to do it um lastly Joey, you are, you know, you're the guy when it comes to Alabama baseball. You know, you, you got the starting lineup, uh, starting rotation right uh, for this weekend's matchup against the number one Texas Longhorns. Um, just kind of, you know, what did you see last week out of the Xavier series that went really well? And what do you think Alabama's got to do to beat Texas? Well, as far as, you know, reflections from this, you know, the first five games, obviously Alabama started out 5-0. and oh. I think, you know, on in their – in their lineup, they've really added a lot of power this year. And Coach Bo has really always been kind of a coach that emphasizes small ball. And they were able to do that very effectively against Xavier, Alabama State, and Jacksonville State. Um, as far, the problem, though, is that while they have a, a, a lot of depth um, overall, um, they don't have necessarily a lot of experience, um, at, at least in the in – the, sorry, different point, <laughs> correct point, wrong thing – Moving on to pitching is what I was going to say. They have a lot of depth in the pitching rotation compared to last year, but what they lack there is experience. So 
I, I think that, and then for the positions, uh, for the position, for the fielders, that's where it's really, it's the exact opposite. You have, you have a lot of experience, but you don't have a lot of depth. So clarifying that, I know that was very confusing. Um, as far as the pitching is concerned, um, like I said, um, lack of lack of experience with a lot. And Coach Bo has been talking a lot about how there's not a lot of separation between his top seven, eight guys in the, in, you know, uh, that, that could be starting pitchers, which a lot of times that could be a bad thing. Um, but for this team, that's actually, that's really a good thing because of the level they've been playing at. We saw Garrett McMillan transfer from Shelton State really have a solid start. He was their Friday starter last weekend against Xavier. We saw Antoine John, you know, play better. Grayson Hitt had a, had a good out, outing on Sunday. Um, their midweek guys have also been putting in work. Um, so just overall, I think this team is, is relatively improved from last year. The problem is that they still play in the Southeastern Conference, <laughs> which is always a very, very difficult conference to play baseball in. Um, and they have to play seven of the uh, – there are eight SEC teams ranked in the top 25 this year. Alabama has to play seven of them. The only one they're not playing this year in the regular season is Vanderbilt. So it's going to be very difficult for them. But talking about Texas, Texas is a team that's just loaded – when it comes to pitchers, um, I was looking at their stats earlier, and of their of their uh, four of their five starters, uh, from going back to last Friday, didn't give up a single run, um, and the other one, their their other starter, only gave up one run in in five innings. So they have really really talented pitchers. Um, I believe out of the fifteen pitchers that they've started overall, only four of them have given up a run, and three of those four have only given up one run. So it's really really talented on the mound for the Longhorns. Um, this is a, their number one consensus, you know, ranked team for a reason. Um, I think Alabama is going to have its, its difficulties. Um, but the good thing about playing a high profile team like Texas this early is that you can kind of, it's kind of like what Nate Oates did with Alabama basketball. You schedule these difficult teams early so you can kind of gauge where you're at and what you need to improve on heading into the conference play. And so I think this will be a difficult test. I think Alabama, if they win, if they win any of the games, they'll probably win one. I think I think they could probably win their Sunday game. Um, but that being said, you know, it's a really great opportunity for this team to go and play a top team, you know, with still several weeks before conference play starts. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting matchup. Hopefully the weather works out. I was looking at the weather and also yeah. they adjusted the first pitch times and it's not looking great mm -hmm. for Saturday's game. Um, yeah. Hopefully they can get all three in. That would be wonderful. But yeah, Alabama wants to come back from Austin at least six and two. At, mm -hmm. I mean, five and three does not sound. And they can. Ridiculous. Yeah, and they really can. Um, I think if if their bats can keep hitting like they've been doing, you know, I I think that they they've recorded double digit hits in several of their games at this point. So um, now how that stacks up against Texas's pitching that's the key question. But They've been succeeding in scoring runs. They've been succeeding at, at the small ball games. So hopefully that will that will just continue to improve. But it's going to be a hurdle no matter what. Your guy Sorry. Jarvis hit one on Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, on the state, hit one. And, and, hey, how about the guy, Dia Dottie? I told you he's going to be the position player to get Alabama <laughs> over the hump this year. How about walk-off opening day um, when uh, when Garrett just kind of got affected, I think, by the Musketeers hitting the long ball themselves, um, especially in the opening at bat. That's why I was kind of joking with some guys on First Twitter. Pitch. I was like, yeah, I was like, there goes the season. I was like, there goes the season. Home run in the first at bat, um, Tony. You got yeah. Go it was kind first. of poetic. The, the first and last pitch of that game were home runs. <laughs> it's like a booking. <laughs> Alabama at one point was on pace to give up infinite runs in in the season. That'd be bad. That'd be a bad look for Coach Bo. Um, definitely wouldn't go to uh, Bomaha with that formula at all. Um, but no, Joe, that's, that's going to be exciting. Uh, we we look forward to your coverage again, especially for Alabama baseball. Um, and what they're going to do this weekend out in Austin. Hey, the baseball team's just prepping up for the football matchup coming up in the fall there. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, because think about it, Texas is number one with Alabama coming to town. And then when football comes in, Alabama will more than likely be number one coming in um, to, to Austin. So, yeah. But no, that thanks. Should be, should, be, should be a lot of fun. Sorry, I thought you were throwing it to Tony Thank there. Um, no, it should be a lot of fun. And, uh, Clayton will be covering, uh, for those listening, Clayton's one of our interns, and he does a really great job doing live updates for baseball. He'll actually be covering the baseball game this weekend as I will be moving. But be sure to be sure if you see his name in the byline to give him some attention. He's, he's been covering baseball for a couple of years, too, and he does a really great job. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on here, guys. That was Joey Blackwell. For Tony Sukalis, I am Tyler Martin. This has been another edition of the All Things Bama podcast. Thank you for listening and watching now.